Today on Would You Believe It? Discover secrets from the mummy's tomb, revealing high-tech surgery performed thousands of years before the technology was believed to exist. Hear the enchanting sound of the world's most fragile musical instrument and meet the man who brought it back to life. See the tragic story of the elephant with a drinking problem and travel to Monet's garden in Giverny, France, where every spring produces a new and original Monet. Visit the strange, the bizarre, and the unexpected on Would You Believe It? An Egyptian tomb, deathly still for centuries, the air trapped inside since the high priest slid the last stone into place over 3,000 years ago. Hieroglyphs tell of the jealously guarded secrets inside, often protected by a curse, extending its power since the days of antiquity to intrude on the fears and superstitions of the present day. Such a curse carried off Howard Carter, discoverer of the famous tomb of King Tutankhamun in the Valley of the Kings. Yet the explorer presses on, a new discovery surely awaits around the corner. For two centuries, explorers have been tracking down the treasures of ancient Egypt. Fresh finds are rare, and nowadays are more likely to remain in Egypt. So what is a museum to do if it wants to expand its collection of Egyptian artifacts? Here in San Jose, California, amidst the high tech of Silicon Valley, the Rosicrucian Museum has the finest collection on the West Coast. This mummy was a child of a wealthy family. The black substance covering his face is resin. This slender body really was a mummy. She was the lady of the Tuher house who died in the year 663 BC. And this intricately decorated sarcophagus contains the mummy of a priest called Nesemin. No Egyptian tomb would be complete without a menagerie of animal companions and the Rosicrucian Museum is no exception. This baboon shows the astounding amount of love and craftsmanship that went into making an eternal friend. It wasn't necessary to mummify the whole animal, which was lucky for the artisan who had to preserve this bull's head, the only one of its kind in the world. More manageable mummification projects of the time included cats, like this one, perfectly preserved inside its reed basket after more than 2,000 years. And this fish, presumably the proud trophy of a pharaoh who wanted to take his catch with him to the next world. Extensive as the collection is, there was a time when the museum wanted to expand. But where would you look if your museum needed a mummy or two? For the curators of the Rosicrucian Museum, the answer was simple. When they wanted to buy themselves a Christmas gift of two ancient sarcophagi, or mummy cases, they turned to a mail-order catalog, Christmas special edition, of course. Neiman Marcus prides itself on being able to offer the perfect gift. For Christmas 1971, they were selling a range of gifts specially selected as his and hers. And alongside the jewelry and ladies' wear were a his and hers mummy case matching set. While other museums scoffed at the idea, the Rosicrucians of San Jose gladly wrote out the check and mailed off their order. These are what they got in return. The sarcophagus of High Priest Usurmantu dated from 630 B.C., accompanied by the sarcophagus of a female noble, Erterau, dating from the 3rd to 5th century B.C. Both cases are in excellent condition, the colors on the intricate hieroglyphs still bright after more than two millennia. After a period of uncertainty, being bought by a department store and then sold on as Christmas gifts, these artifacts have now found a fitting home. For the sarcophagus of Usurmantu, however, the story was not over. While it was in transit, it was noticed that the case was heavier than expected. This is what was inside. When the curators opened up the casket, they discovered they had an unexpected bonus gift, a mail-order mummy, the high priest Usurmantu himself. Amazingly, neither Neiman Marcus nor the previous owner, rumored to be a member of the English aristocracy, had opened up the case to discover Usurmantu's existence. Now he is on display at the museum so that students of Egyptology can study the incredible results of the Egyptian skillful embalming process. Usurmantu is in such good shape that fragile tissue like eyelids have been preserved. His teeth have also survived well, if not well kept. Notice the wear on the upper molar, 
giving vital clues to Egyptian diet and lifestyle. The only part of his body to have suffered over the years has been the toes on his left foot. But even this breakage allows us a valuable look at a cross-section of mummified flesh. The most amazing thing about Usurmantu was discovered when he was unwrapped. Usurmantu has had knee surgery 2,500 years before such technology was believed to exist. Scientists from Brigham Young University in Utah examined the leg. First, they took x-rays. Then they drilled through the bone to allow access to an arthroscopic camera for a closer look. This is what they discovered, a silver pen. Amazingly, the pen uses the same biotechnology as modern medical practices. The corkscrew-shaped sterling silver implant is specially designed to be attached to the still-growing bone. This technology was only recently rediscovered. An extensive series of tests made on the tissue surrounding the pen led many scientists to believe that this surgery may have been done during Usurmantu's life without anesthetic. For now, the Rosicrucian Museum considers its collection complete. Much work still remains to uncover the secrets of Usurmantu and his surgery. However, the curators know that a time will come when they need to expand further, but they're not worried. There's always Christmas to look forward to. This man is recovering a little piece of history. Gerhard Finkenbeiner works here in his low-tech factory on the outskirts of Boston, making some of the most complicated and important high-tech glassware for many of the world's biggest scientific corporations. He and his one other craftsman have spent many years working here, learning and honing their skills. Many of the items they build for their clients are top secret and often cost tens of thousands of dollars. In their business, it pays for Gerhard and his colleague to have an expert's touch. But what has all this got to do with Benjamin Franklin and a long forgotten musical instrument? Mr. Finkenbeiner has always been interested in putting his hard-learned expertise to other more diverse uses. It took him many years of intricate work to perfect these rotating bulbs of quartz. However, it requires a leap of imagination to even guess their purpose. When an amplifier is turned on, they become a magnificent peal of bells. And these strange-looking quartz rods, a rising scale. But when Gerhard discovered an old manuscript referring to an even more bizarre instrument, he knew this was going to be his next project. The description of the instrument mentioned a magic sound and a healing sound, so I got very curious and promised myself to make one one day for me to see uh, how, if that is true. So using methods long forgotten, he set about reconstructing the object he'd heard so much about, the glass harmonica. This curious instrument, built by Mr. Finkenbeiner, is one of the first of its kind for nearly 200 years. Forgotten for two centuries, the glass harmonica was once thought of as an accessory for all fashionable households. Now reconstructed, the instrument can once again be studied, and its hypnotic sounds brought to life once more. In 1743, when an Irishman named Richard Puckeridge rubbed a wet finger on wine glasses at a dinner table, a new and beautiful sound was discovered. A few years later, Benjamin Franklin witnessed a performance of an instrument based on Puckeridge's discovery. Known as the angelic organ, in reality it was no more than a number of wine glasses in a case. Franklin loved the sound it created, but he knew he could do better. This is a glass harmonica with a range of three octaves, uh, about 37 cl glass bells or cups. We now have an electric motor to simplify the effort of turning it. 
I'm sure Franklin would have approved also. Before the glass harmonica was invented by Benjamin Franklin, uh, the only musical instrument available was the wine glasses or a set of glasses that could be attuned with water and put on a table. They cover a large area and then the player could reach two at a time and play rather nice things. But Franklin noticed the, the limitation of reaching cups and playing a certain number at one time. So he came up with the idea of putting them inside each other. He named his new instrument the glass harmonica. Franklin sent word to his contemporaries in the music world in Europe, describing the amazing new sound he'd harnessed. But these composers were not just anyone. His contemporaries were musical giants, such as Mozart, Haydn, and Beethoven. What better proving ground for his new design? But the instrument struck a discordant note with many people. A teach-yourself guide accompanying the instrument warned, if you can be irritated or disturbed by bad news or by your friends, or if you have been deceived by a lady, abstain from playing, as this will only increase your disturbance. A famous Viennese doctor, Franz Anton Mesmer, gained notoriety when he used the instrument as part of his experiments to send his patients into a trance-like state. We know this conditioning today as hypnosis or mesmerizing. With such bad press, craftsmen stopped making glass harmonicas. That was until Gerhard Finkenbeiner decided to make his. Uh, Benjamin Franklin designed the glass harmonica and uh, chose the thickness of the cups meaning the size of the cups. From pictures, of course, I could guess what these dimensions were. My instrument was played for the first time in 1982, and to my surprise, the instrument was sold for $3,000. In his day, Franklin used the only glass available to him. Now, Gerhard Finkenbeiner uses the purest glass there is, quartz. The quartz is heated to 3,100 degrees Fahrenheit. Once at the desired temperature, Gerhard blows through this tube to form the glass into a bulb. The bulb is then cut in half, creating two identical bowls. The bells, or bowls, are then immersed in a substance that delicately wears the glass to its final thickness. Sanding them down on this machine, he can alter the pitch of each bowl. As the depth decreases, its pitch gets higher. The musician creates the sound by rubbing a wet finger against the bowl. Here he's using distilled water to protect the crystal from damaging mineral deposits. This slight friction causes the whole bowl to reverberate, producing a tone. You can see how the quartz vibrates and wobbles in this demonstration. It also shows just how exact each bowl needs to be. To produce the perfect tone, you need the perfect bowl. If Gerhard produces anything less than perfect, the sound is anything but perfect. In his workshop, Gerhard spends hours checking and rechecking the tones of the bells. Like the craftsman of Franklin's time, Gerhard relies heavily upon his experienced ear to tell the notes apart. Today, however, Gerhard also uses precision sound equipment to help him ensure every note is exactly what the musicians and audiences expect. In this small factory in Waltham, Massachusetts, Gerhard and his company have built glass harmonicas for collectors all around the world, to date producing over 150 harmonicas. But if you're thinking of buying one for your collection, think again. Because of the hundreds of hours of painstaking work required to produce each one, you can expect your glass harmonica to cost you $15,000. Its cost is due to the combination of traditional glass blowing skill with groundbreaking technology. But while the harmonica sells well, still relatively few people have heard of it. However, Gerhard does already have a worldwide audience with one of his other glass instruments, although most people may never realize it. This is a church bell. As it rotates, there is a little hammer or clapper falling down and uh, generates a sound. Sometimes when I'm alone evenings, I'm thinking of how many bells are all ringing in different places of the world. It's a great feeling to know that this is all going on by itself. As pleased as he is with his ingenious bells, for Gerhard there is nothing quite like the unique sound of the glass harmonica. So I really think it's touching my soul somehow, the sound, which no other instrument really has produced.
In 1796, everyone here in the seaport town of Salem, Massachusetts was pretty much used to cries of devil creature and Satan's child. This was, after all, the town that had executed many of its townsfolk for being witches. But this morning, no one would have blamed anyone standing here watching the good ship America unloading its cargo onto the dockside for being alarmed at what they saw. The holds were emptied onto the docks and the last item was hoisted off the ship. As it was winched up above the growing and ever more terrified crowd, not one of them had any idea what their eyes were seeing. Because, it would seem, the hideous creature causing so much distress on the dock that morning was Old Bet, a three-ton, 16-foot long elephant. And Old Bet was angry. She had spent nearly three months traveling the high seas, locked up at the hands of less than expert elephant keepers. The young master of the ship, Jacob Cronenshield, had taken an order for an elephant from an American entrepreneur. He expected to buy the beast for $450, but sell it for up to 10,000. But the enterprise was soon at risk. Since most of the crew had never even seen an elephant before this voyage, they didn't know how to care for one. So Old Bet ran out of water. To quench her thirst, the well-meaning mariners let her drink the only other liquid on board, beer, barrels and barrels of it. She was drinking up to 30 barrels of beer a day. As Old Bet was lowered to the ground, confused and disoriented, it was clear to everyone this was not just a wild animal. She was positively livid with an elephantine hangover. But this was not going to be the end of her traveling days, for there waiting to greet her was her new owner, Hakaliah Bailey, ancestor of the famous circus family. He had bought a half stake in Old Bet and planned to exhibit her all around the eastern states in his show. At first, she didn't want to move, but Bailey made it clear to her he had a cartload full of beer for any befuddled beast willing to follow him. So long as he supplied her with suds, Old Bet was happy touring with her new master. Gentle as she was, Old Bet was still an elephant with a problem. These are the ankle chains that kept her on the wagon behind the rest of the circus. He dressed her in this beautiful sash, which she wore everywhere. And he kept the money Bet earned him safely locked up in this, a trunk of his own. Bailey's six months touring soon came to an end. Now it was his partner's turn. So he walked old Bet through the fields and delivered her to this barn. But when Bailey returned six months later for his share of the takings, the associate, a heavy drinker himself, told his profit share partner there was no profit to share. He complained Old Bet's drinking habit was enough to put any man out of business. Bailey was furious. He picked up a gun and aimed it at the elephant. His partner struggled with him, saying he had no right to shoot their elephant. Hakaliah said he had no intention of harming his partner's investment. He was only going to shoot his own half. The bumbling partner suddenly gave in and parted with what money he had. The experience seemed to bond master and elephant. For many more years, Old Bet and Bailey traveled to the small communities of the eastern states together again, and the money rolled in. That was until they stopped at the pretty village of Alfred, Maine. One misty morning, a farmer working in a field near the town saw an awesome shape tramping ever closer to him. In fear of his life, he ran for a shotgun, charged back across this road, aimed, then fired three times. This monument marks the spot where poor old Bet had been grazing beside his field. She stumbled around a little more than was usual in her death throes. Old Bet was taking this journey alone. She unceremoniously slid down a steep embankment into a clay pit and died. Hakaliah was distraught and immediately sought out the judge and had charges brought against the men. The judge, however, was a city man and let the accused walk free, saying nothing that big or that ugly deserves to walk on the face of God's earth. Bailey returned to Summers, New York, where he built this hotel called the Elephant Hotel in honor of his friend. Underneath its grand sign, he erected a statue to her. And she's still here today, a memorial ensuring she was an elephant he would never forget. Old Bet's story doesn't end there. A year after Old Bet died, another circus owner dug up what he could find of her. Even after she had passed on, she made her way back to New York to bring in the crowds once more. Recently, a paleontologist studying the area around Alfred had to back down from his excited claims that he discovered prehistoric mastodon remains in a nearby clay pit. 
The locals listened to him and laughed. They knew Old Bet had just put in one final performance. Would you believe it? The Impressionist painter Claude Monet was a perfectionist. As a student in bustling Paris, he displayed a desire to capture the truth of a moment in his art. He spent many years traveling around Europe, striving to find just the right light, shape, and color for his paintings. But when he settled down to paint at this house in Giverny, his fanatical desire for perfection took a final step. Monet was used to starting with a blank canvas, but as he prepared to paint here, he began with a bare landscape. Every plant, every shrub, even the famous water lilies in his man-made lake were carefully placed here by Monet to create exactly the setting he required. It was just this desire for precision that drew Monet's eye to this picturesque house as he passed by on a speeding train. Soon after, he moved in here with the lady who was to become his second wife. With a modest income from sales of his paintings in Paris and with her family's wealth, they soon restored this old farmhouse to its former splendor. Monet added windows and pulled down several walls to harness the quality of light he only found in this part of France. His relative wealth also allowed him to purchase a number of Japanese watercolors, which inspired his next endeavor. This is Japanese water garden. He excavated an enormous pit and diverted a local stream to fill it, despite the great opposition from local farmers, who believed his strange foreign plants would poison the water. Ever eager to leave his house, he loved to wander through his garden, making lists that he sent to nurseries all over France, detailing his requirements for thousands of rare and exotic plants and seeds. He developed his new passion for botany and was soon able to mix colors and shapes of plants as easily and expertly as he was able to mix paint. Weeping willows, wisterias, and bamboo wood created a natural canvas on which to paint the surrounding vegetation with splashes of hollyhocks, daisies, and poppies. Monet organized the planting of 200,000 plants here, 100,000 of which needed to be replaced every year. It was a magnificent feat, and just as in his paintings, he broke the rules. He placed flowers wherever they looked best and left the rest to nature. He molded the shapes in the garden into asymmetries and curves, motifs and deeply personal concepts of nature. But in search of the ultimate landscape, above all, he'd made this garden so he could paint it. It was in his garden at Giverny that he painted some of his most remarkable and memorable works of art, including many depicting this familiar Japanese bridge. But the world Monet recorded wasn't this tranquil sea of plants and flowers, but a misty, and largely inverted world of light and the blooms reflected in his lake. To get the atmosphere of his paintings perfect, when he couldn't find the elements he wanted to paint naturally, he created a world for himself. He spent just over 20 years here in his garden, stimulated by the ever-changing mood of his creation. During this period, the elderly Monet was having increasing problems with cataracts and had difficulty seeing his enchanted garden at all. The abstract images he now saw gave birth to a new artistic vision, which we now know as abstractionism. Now in his garden, decades after his death, every spring, Monet produces a new, original work of art. Would you believe it? <laughs>